um, but just as batches of neurons in the cortex right underneath the skull produce electrical potentials when those neurons fire, when they're active, they also produce magnetic fields. Was there a question? So, okay. They also produce magnetic fields, okay? So let me remind you of 802. Uh, maybe you've all had 802 by now, anyway, right? Um, so uh, right-hand rule, a current going this way, you get a magnetic field like that. Everybody remember right-hand rule? Okay. So now, what happens when you have a bit of cortex sitting on the outside of the brain where a whole bunch of, I have a picture of this coming up next, boom. Okay, so here's a piece of cortex. Like imagine you like, took the skull off here and you looked. Here's a piece of the surface of my brain where there's a fold in there, okay? So now imagine that there's a whole bunch of um, uh, electrical activity in neurons in the cortex going in this direction here, boom, like that. What way is the magnetic field going? It's kind of going in the plane of the cortex, in the plane of the, the scalp, right? Now imagine deep down in this fold, in the sulcus in the brain, not really deep or you wouldn't see it, but a little bit down. Now we've got current going this way, so right hand rule here. This magnetic field is gonna come outside the brain and be detected outside the brain better than this one. Everybody get that? You're just gonna do your little right hand thing, right? So in general, um, electrical activity that goes um, parallel to the skull is going to be better detected with magnetic fields outside because the magnetic field will stick outside the head where you can detect it. Everybody got that? Okay. Um, so here is uh, my postdoc, Leila Ishik, uh, and me, uh, and a picture taken by Chris Brewer back there um, using in the MEG machine here at MIT. I'm in the machine. It looks like a big hair dryer. It's not. It's much more expensive than a hair dryer. Um, it's actually a big Dewar flask full of liquid helium cooled to minus 200 and something. Um, and the reason there's that, it's right around my head there. And inside that are 300 magnetic sensors uh, called squids for superconducting quantum interference devices. Okay, and so they are just there to detect tiny, tiny, tiny little changes in the uh, magnetic field outside my head when I'm looking at different stimuli. Okay, so this is very much like scalp ERPs. We're just measuring magnetic fields instead of electrical fields. Okay, so um, I think I said all this. Yes, and the field strengths we're measuring are about 10 to the minus 13 Tesla. Okay, that's a millionth the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so these are tiny. And that field strength is a, um, is a whole lot smaller than the ambient magnetic noise. So for example, in this building, as you may have noticed, there's a train out there. So when we built our MEG machine right next to the train tracks, everybody's saying, what the hell's gonna happen when the train goes by? That's gonna have a much bigger effect on the local magnetic field than this little neural activity in some subject's head. Uh, and so uh, a big part of the expense of an MEG system is the many, many, many layers of magnetic shielding you need around the device so that you can isolate these tiny little magnetic field changes from the brain from those that are happening all around us all the time, okay? That's why you do all this inside a box. Okay, lots of shielding. All right, uh, these details are just for fun. I don't, you don't need to remember what a squid is. I don't care about that. Just have a sense of what the, what's being detected and, and so forth. Okay, so cool thing, MEG was invented right here at MIT by this guy, David Cohen. Uh, it was invented in the 60s. Here is his first MEG device. Isn't that awesome? Um, it was in one of these buildings right over, actually a building that no longer exists. Um, and, uh, and so there's a subject in there doing an MEG experiment, okay? Um, okay, so um, now our key question. Can MEG tell us anything about face perception? That's our lens on all of these methods, okay? for now. Uh, well, um, yes indeed it can. Turns out that you can get a face selective magnetic response just as you can get a face selective electric response with ERPs and it's 170 milliseconds after stimulus onset. It is almost certainly the same thing detected from its magnetic field um, correlates just as it can be detected from its electrical correlates. So here's some ancient data from my lab about 20 years ago. I think this is when we, the M170 was first found with MEG. So again, this is time going this way. And this is just the response of some magnetic sensor somewhere around T5 or T6 that I talked about before. Um, and you can see a great big honking response in this subject, probably me, but I don't remember, 
um, when this person looked at faces, just about 170 milliseconds after stimulus onset, and you see some response to, in this case, animals and houses and objects, but it's a whole lot lower. Okay? Okay. So it's, you know, it's very similar to what we uh, talked about before with ERPs. It tells, but it tells us again that face detection, at least discriminating faces from animals, houses, and objects, happens pretty fast. Okay? All right. Um, and it suggests that there may be some kind of specialized brain machinery for face processing. All right. So what are the uh, strengths and weaknesses of these methods? They're totally non-invasive. You're just measuring stuff from outside the head. You haven't removed any parts. Um, the temporal resolution is fabulous, less than a millisecond. And that is great if you care deeply about computation. If you want to know the algorithm, you need to know what happens at each moment in time. And if face recognition is done within less than half a second, which it is, you can show in other behavioral experiments I didn't discuss, that means that the components, the component steps in that computation are happening on the order of tens of milliseconds. They're unfolding super fast, and you need temporal resolution to see those things unfold. Okay? So that's important. Oh, I just said why we'd care about time. I'm supposed to ask you that. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> um, okay, but all the things that I've talked about so far are just relying on these particular ERP or MEG responses that have particular properties. The P1, the N1, the N170, the M170 have these particular properties, and so we can study those particular bumps and learn something. So that's nice, but it's sort of limited, because what if there isn't a particular bump for the thing we're interested in, right? And so it used to be that that was sort of mostly what you could do with ERPs and MEG, but there's a whole cool new thing happening now where people are taking data from ERPs and MEG and applying fancy magnetic, lear uh, magnetic uh, machine learning um, algorithms to try to extract information from that pattern of response. Actually, not even that fancy. It's like basic linear SVMs for those of, guys, those of you who do this stuff. Um, and from that, they're trying to decode what information is available in that response at each latency after stimulus onset. And that's super cool, and we'll talk more about that next time. Okay. This is a much more general way to take these data and extract information from them than to just rely on the particular components that people have labeled and studied and tried to characterize. Yeah? I'm not getting enough questions. I don't know if I'm being boring or so lucid that everything is crystal clear. Excellent question. Just the question you should be thinking. We start with behavior because that's where the, the you know, deep theoretical insights about processing come from, and then we use the brain to test those things. So that was, of course, one of the first things people tested. Good for you for uh, being on the ball with that. The finding is a little bit surprising and puzzling to most people in the field. What you find is that you do get an N170 for inverted faces. It's slightly later. I forget, like 10, 20 milliseconds. It's only slightly later and larger. I know. I, what's up with that? I don't totally get that. I don't think anybody has a good story about it. Um, that's also true if you, if you mess up a face in any way and make it a little bit harder to recognize, but still clearly a face, like you blur it, you put stuff on top of it, you mess it up in various ways, you get the same thing. The N170 is a little bit lighter and a little bit bigger. Anyway, it's a good question and it's a sort of puzzling answer. Okay. Um, okay. So, blah, blah, blah. Um, disadvantages. Um, the spatial resolution is just awful uh, with both EEG and MEG. There's a whole thing where people are making beautiful movies. You may have seen these in you know, 900 or wherever else where people say, oh, here's an MEG movie of activity in the brain. Over, the, you know, over 500 milliseconds, it starts here, and then it goes there, and then it goes here, and you see these nice little blobs moving around in the brain. A lot of that is BS. The fundamental problem is not unrelated to the fundamental problem of vision. And that is, the brain is this big three-dimensional thing, and you have a bunch of sensors on the outside, and they all have very low resolution. And you're trying to infer from that where in the brain exactly um, is the source of that activity. And that is an ill-posed problem, just like the problem of vision and most of the problems in cognition. Okay, So just like vision and cognition, Ill-posed doesn't mean, we give up, there's no answer, we're screwed, that's it. Just as with vision and cognition, 
people who are trying to solve, the, scientists who are trying to solve this ill posed problem do just what your brains do with difficult visual problems. They make some guesses. They rely on other information. They make some assumptions. They make some guesses and they do the best they can. And it's not, you know, zero information. It's just not that good. Okay? Maybe at best you get a resolution of a few centimeters. I actually think it's worse than that. And it depends where you are in the brain. Uh, but it's pretty bad. EEG is much cheaper. And about 10 years ago, uh, but MEG has the cachet. You know, you tell people you've used MEG, they'll just go, oh, you've used MEG. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Right? Um, and, um, you know, and not that many places have it, so it's fancy. Um, the guy who invented MEG, David Cohen, whose picture I showed you, uh, just said, gave a talk here around 10, 15 years ago, at, right after they built a, you know, $3 million MEG machine over at MGH Charlestown. And all those people came over, including the people who were responsible for building this really expensive thing. And he said, listen, I invented this method. And one of the first things I did way back in the 70s was to measure is it any better than EEG, which is cheaper and easier? And the answer I got was, not really. So that's why I'm not still working on it anymore. So he had this whole kind of, you know, um, anti-capitalist screed about how it was like the companies, I'm pretty partial to those things, uh, it was like the companies that were trying to make a profit, sold this whole PR thing about how MEG was so fancy and got people to spend millions of dollars where really they didn't need to. I, my guess is that it's, it, nothing, is, nothing is ever that simple. Uh, I think it's a big part of it. There was a big kind of, you know, cachet to MEG and all kinds of people bought it because it was fancy. And actually, it's, it's, it's a little better in some ways, but not much, right? Um, but importantly, it's not just that, it, the, the, the real answer is, it's not that it's not better. It's maybe a little better in some ways, but mostly it's different. Remember the physics of the situation, right? So. You can detect stuff down in the sulci, not out on the surface with MEG. Uh, and, and ERPs have slightly different properties. So really what you want to do is do both at once and use the different differential responses with the knowledge of the structure of the cortex to try to solve that inverse problem. That gives you a little more handle on the inverse problem. Doesn't make it, it's still ill-posed, but it's better.